What's up, everybody, and welcome to Three Clicks and a Hick. That is the game where I go to a Wikipedia page and we try to see if we can get to Hitler uh, in three clicks or less. Yes, the game is actually called Three Clicks to Hitler, but I just didn't feel like putting Hitler in the title. So three clicks and a hick it is. So the way the game normally works is that you just go to a random Wikipedia article. Like there's like a generator you click and it gives you a random one. But I, I no, I want to start on one that I have decided so that we can also, you know, learn a little bit about history as we go. And I think it'll make it more fun. So today what I'm going to choose because I've been watching the show Manhunt on Apple TV and because uh, I think I'm probably going to talk about the Booth Brothers on Putting On Airs, my podcast with Trey Crowder this week, I decided that we would go with Junius Brutus Booth, uh, who is the father of assassin John Wilkes Booth. So that's where we're going to start from. Let's see if we can get to old Schmeckley McHitler fuck in, th in three clicks or less. All right, here we go. Junius Brutus Booth, born May 1796, uh, died in uh, 1852. He was an English-American stage actor. He was the father of actor John Wilkes Booth. Yeah, when your kid does that, that's that's going to be the first line of your uh, Wikipedia. That's very unfortunate because I assume he was a good actor in his own right. You know, uh, the Booth family, a lot like the Baldwins uh, in, a, in a couple regards, um, just in the sense of their entire family was into stage acting. And uh, as, you know, we've all learned in, I guess, well, where I'm from, you learned it in middle school, elementary school even, because we're a Civil War town. The Booths were a famous uh, acting family. Uh, his other children included Edwin Booth, the foremost tragedian of the mid to late 19th century. That's great. I only I, I read tragedian the other day when I was reading about John Wilkes Booth for something else. And it makes so much sense because it's the opposite of like a comedian. It's the opposite of comedy, like a comedian and a tragedian. But I've never up until I read that, like heard anybody referred to as that. And I don't know, like, I don't know why that went away. Cause if there's like, you know, people are referred to as comedians that aren't, stand-up comedians like i think there's a lot of people who would call will ferrell a comedian and why wouldn't you like he is a master of comedy but you only like you call masters of comedy that act you call them comedians but i don't know why we lost tragedian because i think that's a lot cooler of a phrase than saying he's a very good dramatic actor that might just be me but i i'm bringing tragedian back who would be the foremost tragedian? I mean, I guess speaking of Lincoln, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, probably the greatest tragedian of all time. Most of the movies that he plays in, it's pretty tragic, you know? I also think that it could uh, go to singer-songwriters, too, like Elliot Smith, 100% tragedian. Uh, he was also an actor and theater manager. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was an actor and theater manager. And who the... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Edwin Booth was the foremost tragedian and an actor and theater manager. And also they had a kid named Asia Booth Clark. That is interesting. That's an interesting name for that time. I mean, I don't know a lot of people named Asia now, but around maybe they maybe they hadn't had time to be racist against Asians yet. Now, granted, I say that um, John Wilkes Booth from all I know, was the only, like, Southern sympathizer of the family. Like, Edwin, at least they portray it this way in Manhunt and some of the things I've read, like, Edwin was absolutely not a secessionist, and John Wilkes Booth, like, brought shame onto the family even before he assassinated the president just because he was outspoken in his beliefs that, like, the South was right and the institution of slavery was good. Uh, so there's that. Oh, by the way, uh, I should uh, have have mentioned that I'm going to make a couple rules for this to make it less easy. I'm not allowed to click on John Wilkes Booth um, or Abraham Lincoln because just because I feel like that would be too easy. Like, I feel like if I click John Wilkes Booth, Hitler might be on his page because there might be a whole section of like, here's other people that fucking suck. So I'm going to have to click on something that's not one of them. 
Booth was born in St. Pancras, London, Great Britain, the son of Richard Booth, a lawyer and avid supporter of the American cause and Jane Elizabeth Game. His paternal grandfather was John Booth, a silversmith, and his paternal grandmother, Elizabeth Wilkes, was a relative of the English radical and politician John Wilkes. Oh, Lord, that family had a lot going on. While he was growing up, Booth's father tried to settle his son in a lengthy succession of professions. Booth recalls of his childhood, I was destined by my controllers first uh, for the printing office, then to be an architect, then to be a sculptor and modeler, then a lawyer, then a sailor. Of all of these, I, prefer, I preferred those of sculptor and modeler. So already had sort of an artistic mindset to him. On September 26th, September 8th, uh, Jesus, Corey, on the 26th of September, you got to read it like the English do, 1811, a single woman named Sarah Blackbeard of St. Leonard Shoreditch, yeah, that place that we all know, gave birth to a son, William, called before a magistrate in March 1812. She stated that one Junius Brutus Booth, who resides at his father's number one dove row in the said parish of St. Leonard Shoreditch. Gentleman is the true and only father of such child. She repeated this as, a, as sworn evidence in 1813 when the child became chargeable on the parish under the poor law, giving Booth's address then as Queen Street, Bloomsbury. Okay, now right below it mentions Brussels. I know that if I click Brussels, we're going to get to Hitler pretty quick. But here's what I suggest, just so we can learn a little bit more. I'm not going for a world record here. I want to find out about this poor law. So let's go with poor law and see if we can get to Hitler from there. How about that? All right. In English and British history, poor relief refers to government and ecclesiastical action. You didn't know I knew the word ecclesiastical, did you? Boom, huh? How about that? Yeah. To relieve poverty. Okay, so this is like some form of welfare. Um, <clears throat> I'll be honest with you. When I heard poor law... And especially as it was pertaining to the 1800s, I definitely thought it was going to be something to the effect of if, hey, you, you're breaking the poor law. You don't have any money to the stockades with you. So it's nice to see that it was uh, the opposite. Various authorities have needed to decide whose poverty deserves relief and also who should bear the cost of helping the poor. Alongside ever-changing attitudes towards poverty, many methods have been attempted to answer these questions since the early 16th century legislation on poverty enacted by the Parliament of England. Obviously, we can click that. Poor relief has developed from being little more than a, syst a systematic means of punishment into a complex system of government-funded support and protection, especially following the creation in the 1940s of the welfare state. I think we could get there with that, too, but let's keep going. In the late 15th century, Parliament took action on the growing problem of poverty, focusing on punishing people for being vagabonds and for begging. A uh, side note, vagabonds. One of my favorite words of all time, first time I ever heard it, uh, was in an Elton John song. Can't remember which one right now, but I've loved it ever since. Uh, <clears throat> the Vagabonds and Beggars Act of 1494, this provided for officers of the law to arrest and hold all such vagabonds, idle and suspect, suspect persons living suspiciously, and them so taken to set in stocks. <laughs> That's fucking exactly what I just said. I knew it. Uh, set in stocks there to remain three nights and have none other sustenance but bread and water. And after the said three days and three nights, to be had out and set at, uh, set at large and to be commanded to avoid the town. Jesus Christ. You're poor. Let's lock you up and barely give you any food. And then, Jesus Christ. I mean, I get why the Tudor people wouldn't want to look at the poor. You know, sure, back then they were, they had the, they were they had the stink lines coming from them. They were they were horrid to look at. Very unpleasant. I totally get it. Um, <clears throat> a little rude though, you know. As historian Mark Rathbone, hey, there's a Rathbone in the uh, Lincoln Show. Rathbone, uh, I believe, was the yeah. Rath, I think Rathbone was the guy that was up in the box with Lincoln who got stabbed by John Wilkes Booth or slashed across the face. I could be wrong on that, but nice to see uh, here. 
As historian Mark Rathbone has discussed in his article, Vagabond, this act of parliament relied on a very loose definition of a vagabond and did not make any distinction between those who were simply unemployed and looking for employment and those who chose to live the life of a vagabond. Just vagabonding for the love of the game. <laughs> that's, a, that's wild. In addition, the act failed to recognize the impotent poor, those who could not provide for themselves. These included the sick, the elderly, the disabled. The lack of This lack of a precise definition of vagabond would hinder the effectiveness of the Vagabonds and Beggars Act 1494 for years to come. Yeah, no shit. All right, like I said, we could go up here and click English and British and Parliament of England. And I'm going to know, I know exactly where to find Hitler on those. I've done it before. That's not fun. I suggest we go just a little bit further down here. Oh, there's old Henry VIII right there. Look at him. God dang. L literally looks just like me if I was to put on that outfit. I'm certain that we're related in some way. Uh, unfortunately, he just did not leave me no money. The problem of poverty in England was exacerbated. I always have trouble with that word. During the early 16th century, by a dramatic increase in the population, this rose from little more than 2 million in 1485 to about 2.8 million by the end of Henry VII's reign. The population was growing faster than the, uh, the economy's ability to provide employment opportunities. The problem was made worse during the English Reformation. Henry VIII severed the ecclesiastical governance of his kingdoms of England and Ireland and made himself the supreme head of the Church of England. This involved the disillusion of the monasteries in England and Wales, the assets of hundreds of rich religious institutions, including their great estates, were taken by the crown. They had a devastating impact on poor relief, according to the historian and Paul Slack, prior to the dis dissolution, it has been estimated that monasteries alone provided 6,500 pounds a year in alms uh, before 1537, equivalent to $4 million in 2021. And that sum was not made good by private benefactions until after 1580. Son of a bitch. In addition to the closing of monasteries, most hospitals, which in the 16th century were generally alms houses rather than medical institutions. All right, you got me. Uh, I know that we're running out of clicks here, but I got to know what alms houses are. Um, here's my, I'll make a prediction on what I think alms houses are. Um, um, no, that's yoga. Is that yoga? That's yoga. I was going to say an almshouse is where you go to, I guess, pray, because when you pray, you go om, but that's uh, that's meditation. Okay, fuck. I have no idea. Let's go to almshouses, and this is, how many clicks is this? This will be the second click, so we really we got to do some work once we get here. An almshouse, also known as a bead, bead, bead house, Poor house or hospital is charitable housing provided to people in a particular community, especially during the Middle Ages. They were often targeted at the poor of a locality and those from certain forms of previous employment or their widows and at elderly people who could no longer pay rent and are generally maintained by a charity or the trustees of a bequest. Alms are, in the Christian tradition, money or services donated to support the poor and the indigent. I knew that. We learned about that in church, and I have completely, look, I got to be honest with you. I was so institutionalized with church that when I finally left, I've done every single thing in my power to like give my own self a CIA level debrief on it so that I could be cleansed. And uh, man, that knowledge uh, would have helped us get to Hitler quicker. I'm going to fuck this up. All right, we got to look for some highlights here. I see Christian. That's not a bad one. That's not a bad one. Subsidized accommodation, social care resources, Anglo-Saxon. That's not a bad one. York, King, Aslan, Middle Ages, Reformation, Abolition of Chanteries Act. Fuck me. Workhouses, the act relief of the poor, sheltered housings. God damn it. Come on, get me to Hitler. William Penn, Maryland, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. No, no, no. Straight jacket. Hitler should have been in one, but that's not going to get us there. Dorothy Dix. Who's that? I can't know because if I click, I've wasted all my clicks. Fuck it. I'm going to Christian because that's how I want to find Hitler. I don't give a fuck if it takes four clicks. Christianity. All right. Jesus Christ, Messiah, prophesies Hebrew Bible, yada, yada, yada. Let's scroll down to controversies. 
God damn, this is long as fuck. Can I command F Hitler? There's no Hitler. Jew. <laughs> Germany. By the way, that is the first time I've ever used control F in my life. And that, uh, boy, that's a game changer. War. Uh, we are all over the place. Fuck. 30 years war. The Thirty Years' War was one of the longest and most destructive conflicts in European history, lasting from 1618 to 1648, fought primarily in Central Europe, and estimated 4.5 rather, to 8 million soldiers and civilians died as a result of battle, famine, or disease, while parts of present-day Germany, boom, there we go, and Hitler. And Hitler. All right, well, it took us way more than three clicks because I got a little cute with it. We'll go for speed next time, you know, but I hope you learned a lot. I had fun. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us on Three Clicks and a Hick. And hey, by the way, if you're watching this on YouTube, you could have seen it earlier and completely ad-free if you were uh, subscribed to BonusCorey.com. Appreciate all of y'all who subscribe over there, who support uh, all the work that I do. And if you didn't enjoy this, I do other stuff. You know what I mean? Can't be, can't be everything for everyone, but I try. Love y'all. Talk to you later. All right. See you. Bye.